whatever. It's, it's really, it's a special thing to realize, you know, someone, you, you know that moment's coming, you're building the relationship and you know, there's a lot of chit chat, you know, talking about football games and, you know, deer season and all this kind of stuff. And, and you know, we, people like open up, are like, well, have you seen my social media? You, you, you want to be my friend there too? You know, and, and then you, you say, oh, yeah, I saw you at a birthday party. Tell me about how that went, you know, and, and they just kind of let you into their lives. And then the next thing you know, they're they're saying, hey, is this really confidential? Mm. I don't really trust you because I'm about to tell you, I mean, mm. you have time, Chaplain, because I got to get something off my chest. And, you know, here comes something, maybe it's about marriage, maybe it's about their family of origin. Uh, you know, it, it could be anything, but it's the thing that's keeping them up at night. And it's so we don't wag our fingers in their face and tell them what to do. Uh, we kind of use more of a Socratic method of just asking really good open questions so that they can come to their own conclusion. Welcome to the Empowered Manhood Podcast, where men rediscover courageous masculinity. Pull up a chair as we gain strength from the stories of God working in the lives of ordinary men today. These men have discovered that in a world of superficiality and isolation, we need authentic brotherhood to gain strength for the battles we face every day. Brought to you by the ministry of CLC, which challenges men to an uncommon pursuit of Christ, welcome to Empowered Manhood. Hey guys, welcome back to the Empowered Manhood Podcast. My name is Mike Hatch and I am the National Relationship Generator for CLC and I'm here as usual with my co-host Chris Bollinger who is an author and speaker. Speaking of which, uh, it, we are very excited here because uh, Chris has just released his new book, 52 Weeks of Strength for Men. And uh, in our next episode, you're going to hear him share a little bit more about that. But, uh, but I'm really excited for him. It's been a long time coming. And if you have had any experience with his first devotional, Daily Strength for Men, you will know what an incredible writer he is and uh, how he really has that, that incredible ability to speak to a man's heart. So make sure you go to Amazon.com, check that out, or, uh, or you can email me or get in contact with Chris uh, in the show notes below. There'll be information on that for you. Now, also, if you're interested in CLC, um, please email me. My email address is mhatch at clchq.org. Again, that's mhatch at clchq.org. I'd love to talk to you about CLC. If you uh, have heard anything on the podcast that has gripped your heart or maybe uh, caused you to think a little bit more deeply or more intentionally about men's discipleship, it would be a privilege to walk alongside you uh, in that journey and, uh, and be a help to you if we can be. Now, today, we are speaking to Richard Buckley, who is a regional vice president for the Corporate Chaplains of America. And Richard, of course, starts out by sharing his story. And, uh, and then we get into some incredible, incredible stories. Look, if you are looking for inspiration today, you've come to the right place. Because these stories that Richard shares with us of changed lives and the way God is moving and acting so profoundly in the marketplace, in the workplace, man, you are, just just get ready. <laughs> get ready because you're gonna get a barrage of unbelievable stories that will, that will totally tug at your heart, maybe even clarify some vision for you, and, uh, and, and I think impact you and others who are listening to the podcast. So um, yeah, so we talk about the role the Corporate Chaplains of America, the organization plays in, in businesses, and of course, how, you know, as a leader in the marketplace, or if you own a business, how you can utilize the corporate chaplains of America in your own uh, workplace for the benefit of your employees as well. All right, let's dive into our interview. Here it is with Richard Buckley. Hey guys, it gives me great pleasure to introduce you to today, our guest, Richard Buckley. And Richard Buckley is with uh, with Corporate Chaplains of America. And Richard, welcome to the Empowered Manhood Podcast. Well, thanks. Great to be here, Mike and Chris. Thank you so much for having me. 
Yeah. And I'm sorry, remind me, tell us real briefly, what, what is your role with corporate, corporate chaplains of America right now? I have the privilege of serving as a regional vice president. And so I have the opportunity to work with four of our regional directors uh, from the operations side. Most of what I do is uh, looking at growth in our different mission fields. Uh, so traveling through much of the Southeast and the Midwest, mm -hmm. uh, talking to business owners and some of our strategic partners uh, about uh, you know, growing mission fields. Fantastic. That's great. And uh, before we, just to give some people, you know, guys who are listening some context, <clears throat> we will obviously get into your, your fence post story, but can you give just a brief uh, few sentences description of what, what Corporate Chaplains of America is? Sure, love to. So uh, we've been around for 26 years. Uh, our founder, Dr. Mark Kress, was a serial entrepreneur, and he came to the point in his career where as he had more and more employees, he realized, you know, I can either run the business well or I can care for these employees. I, I can't do both at the same time. Hmm. Uh, so that led him to sell the business and go to seminary. And while he was at seminary, it's where God gave him this model for uh, the way we do corporate chaplains. So, you know, most people have heard of a chaplain in the context of a military uh, or in the hospital. Well, we do the same thing they do. We just happen to do it in the workplace where people are going to spend 90,000 hours of their <laughs> life. So yeah. we're going straight to them. Uh, most of the companies we serve, we serve with a boots on the ground chaplain who makes weekly rounds. And so they're developing a caring relationship with people. Uh, they're taking that relationship at the speed that the employees want to take it at. Uh, so people open up uh, about life issues uh, in different increments. And, you know, we talk to people about everything from marriage, parenting, caring for aging parents, um, mm -hmm. finance issues. We use, you know, Dave Ramsey's materials, Smart Dollar uh, in the workplace. Uh, we, we make those weekly rounds. And as we get to know people, you know, we, they open up to us. And so maybe they're talking to us mm -hmm. about a mental health issue. You know, that's gone off the charts during the pandemic. Uh, with anxiety uh, being the number one, right. uh, followed by depression. And so we, we talk a lot about that a lot. We talk about mm -hmm. addictions in people's lives. Mm -hmm. And at the end of the day, uh, if they give us permission, uh, we will certainly uh, talk about spiritual matters. But you know, that doesn't always happen overnight. Uh, people, we need to build trust with people uh, through our chaplain team of almost 300 chaplains across the country. Um, mm -hmm. That's another thing that we really enjoy is, is having a nationwide network uh, so we can mm -hmm. care for, you know, an employee may have a relative all the way across the country and maybe they're in the hospital oh. or something like that. And they really want to be there, but they can't be there. Well, someone from our team uh, can typically get in front of them and care for them. Wow. So that's what we get to do each and every day. Uh, we start with building those caring relationships. Uh, everything is confidential. It's permission based. Uh, and, and so we're not ever doing anything that that employee hasn't asked us to do. Right. Uh, but our engagement rate is extremely high. Uh, mm -hmm. And so we love being that employee benefit. We love being that, that extension of the owner's caring heart in mm -hmm. the workplace. I love that. Wow. What a resource to businesses and business owners. Um, that's incredible. Uh, so, Okay, so now thank you for that. Now let's go ahead and and back up a little bit further. View you know about more about you specifically. So obviously, every guest we have on, we ask them to share their fence post story. And for those of you who are first time listeners, that just means if you envision a, a fence along a property, each post vertical post represents a significant moment in life or a significant purpose or person in our life who kind of helps make us who we are today. And, uh, and so, yeah, Richard, we'd love to hear about your, a little bit about your story and uh, how God brought you to be where you are now. Sure, I'd love to share that. It's an interesting journey, like everyone's is. And I, mm -hmm. I grew up in Houston, Texas. And I remember, you know, when I was 17 and my mom was sitting down talking with me one day and she goes, all right, Richard, what do you, what do you want to study? You want to go to college? Uh, you know, we have the funds to be able to send you, but what do you really want to study? And I remember saying, Mom, that's easy. I'm going to run my own business someday. Uh, and that's what I'm going to do. And she said, well, why that? Of all the different things. 
And I said, because I don't like people telling me what to do. <laughs> That's great. <laughs> yes. Uh, you know, and I, and I look back on that, that, that is kind of a, a fence post. That's a starting place because that's really who I was. Uh, I was very driven, but I wanted to do everything my way. And that, so that first year of college, you know, it was kind of an eye opener for me. Like, mm. oh, okay, this is kind of easing into the adult world here. And I had a summer job after that first year uh, as a garbage man. Wow. And, yeah, and I was living in Oklahoma at the time. There was it was over thirty days of a hundred plus temperature. Oh, I, oh, thinking, man. I don't want to do this in the long term. <laughs> this is this is hard work. Yeah, and I'm done every day when I'm done. I don't like it. So college is looking really really good. So I, I go back to college and studying, and you know I, I've got good grades. Um, I'm enjoying it. I got a lot of friends, but there was just something not was missing and I could not put my finger on it and I remember sitting in my dorm room one day and I'm thinking I don't get this I got a party every night if I want it friends I, I got all these things going on I got a bright future my GPA was decent and I, I just kind of sat there contemplating and it was after finals was over and actually the sunset I found myself sitting in a dark room just contemplating and that was not me uh, but I knew something was going on inside me. I just couldn't put my finger on it. And my dad called about that time, but you know, no caller ID, the phone just rings. And I don't know who yeah. it is, but pick it up and he goes, Hey, I got you a job at the oil tool plant where I work. You're going to work with a janitor. And, uh, you know, the pay is really good. Uh, I think, I don't know, back in early eighties, it was like almost $7 an hour. Which that is pretty right. good. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so I was like, I'm there. Uh, well, I meet the janitor. And the first thing he ever says to me is, I've been praying for you. And I look at him, Yeah, first thing out of his mouth. And I, <laughs> I looked at him and smiled and said, why, I'm not sick. <laughs> I'm not sick. Sure, you know, where this was going. And so he just smiled and he said, well, how about, you know, we eat lunch together. And I was like, okay, whatever. And he would talk about, you know, some work stuff. But then he would tell me these long stories about growing up in Kansas on a farm and they were really intriguing uh, and I was driving tractors at this at this plant mowing grass outside so he was teaching me about tractors and it was just really interesting mm. then he would always ask me permission he'd go hey he, he was uh, also an ordained minister and he would pull out a bible from his desk just do you mind if I share something like th this book has really changed my life and I'm like okay uh, to me I was like I don't care I'm sitting in air conditioning you yeah. keep talking you're my boss i'm on the clock so let's yeah and so he he keeps having this conversation with me and one day i realized he's getting a little too close to home like i feel uncomfortable i didn't have the word mm -hmm. in, my, in my vocabulary and it's like this feels weird and so for two weeks he did that and so actually he was he, he would never call himself a chaplain but Really, he was doing a lot of the things that we teach our team to do. He was building a relationship with me. He was asking really good open-ended questions to draw out of me what was going on in my heart. So as a, by then I'm 18 years old. And I really don't know. I don't understand myself. I don't understand life. It's a crucial time in life. And he's just speaking into me. And eventually that uneasy feeling, he said, hey, look, I'm going to share this story, um, say from the gospel of John. Can you go home and maybe read that tonight? Yeah, okay. So he walked me through all four gospels. And so literally he would say, go home tonight, and read Matthew, and we'll talk about it tomorrow. So I go home, I read the whole book of Matthew in one city. And he goes, I said, what do I do now? So he saw that God was working in my heart. Just, just go home and read Mark tonight. So I'm getting my little dusty Bible, wiping it off, reading it, you know, and it's, and, and real quick, Richard, let, I'm sorry to cut you off for just a second. So just, did, we, did you grow up in a home where there was church or any kind of faith of any sort? So my parents were very faithful to take me to church. Okay. Um, but I wasn't paying attention. Like, okay. It, it was a social time for me. And okay. so to me, I'm like, oh, yeah, been there, done that. But this guy, okay. 
was his, there was something about, first of all, I was intrigued, but this guy's a janitor. Like yeah. he should be sad that he's a janitor. <laughs> and, you know, and he drives the ugliest, oldest VW bug I've ever seen. Right. And like, why are you driving that? But he, yeah. he always smiled. He like, he was a definition of joy. And so wow. that's why I was, that's why I was intrigued. Hmm. Like this guy's an enigma to me. I'm going to figure out what makes him tick. Yeah. So as he shared all this with me one night, you know, I came home and I, I, I read Matthew and I read Mark came in the next day and then his name is Jim. I said, Jim, my Bible is defective. And he smiled at me and he goes, why? I said, there's misprints in here because did you know they printed it wrong? I guess, because in Matthew and Mark, they're the same stories. Like, why did they put the same stories? In the, in the, and he just laughed and he just started walking me through the gospel. So it wow. took about two weeks and I came in and he, he could tell one day that I was ready. So wow. he, he, you know, he led me to the Lord and, you know, he actually started discipling me. And then if I fast forward, you know, how crucial that was for the next three years of college, because I literally went back to my dorm and got all the guys on my we were having some kind of a floor meeting about somebody doing something crazy and i just said i, I want to interject something um, i know i was the, the biggest party animal on this floor last year and something's different with me now let me tell you about my journey and i just told everybody like it just came out and i was wow. not not a public speaker Okay, I was like, it made me really nervous, uh, but I, it just came out. And I'm like, what was that? <laughs> then all the, all the Christians on the floor <laughs> gathered around me, you know, and they started discipling me. And so that was amazing because I could have had a really crazy rest of three years. Uh, but that's when God chose to intervene and get my attention. Fast forward to, you know, the next real fence post. Um, my wife and I met in Carrollton, Texas, and we met in a, a singles group. We started dating, eventually got married, and, you know, it was just, it was uh, amazing, you know, how God brought us together. Uh, we, we met in uh, Paris, by the way. Wow. Uh, Paris, Texas. Uh, oh, man, <laughs> you got me. You totally yeah, got me. Get everybody with that. <laughs> uh, but, but we met at a, at a singles retreat there and really hit it off. And, and so when we got married, you know, she was lovingly talking to me one day and she says, you know, let me think we have some opportunities to grow here. And let's, mm -hmm. let's talk about how we can do that and, and, be, and be one. And it wasn't, and within the next week, our Sunday school teacher called us. And he was one of these guys, uh, A.G. Faulkner. Like, I felt like he could read my mind. Like, he'd be up there teaching. And every time he looked at me, I was, like, really convicted. And, like, <laughs> this guy, like, really walks closely with Jesus. And, and he, he intimidated me. I shouldn't have been. Uh, he was a very loving man. Uh, but uh, he called me one night, right after Amy and I had gotten married. And he said, I've been praying about a discipleship group. You know, if you remember Master Life. Um, Southern Baptist literature, a really, really good tool. And it was a 52 week study. And so you'd do six months, take a little break and do another six months. And um, so it was scripture memory. It was uh, really learning how to read the Bible systematically, a lot of spiritual foundation elements in the study. And so I finished the course, put the book on the shelf. And I was like, all right, I, I have been discipled. <laughs> And, all uh, done check yeah, all done. <laughs> and, and he called me back and said are you ready for next i'm like wait there's more he goes, oh yeah i want you to go to people in our church and enlist them tell them how much you grew and invite them and, and you're going to teach them i'm like i got the wrong guy uh i did my part already you know how nervous i get talking in front of people he goes, I know, I want you to pray about it. And I want you to go talk to other groups and, and let them know that you're going to lead this class and I'm going to be in there. I'm going to be your safety net. So, you know, I'll teach some of it, but I really want you to grow through this. And 
you know, looking back on it, he was, he was very intentional in about walking me forward. And I really, really appreciate that. I stumbled so many times. I'm sure I mispronounced more, you know, Bible character names and got stories mm -hmm. confused and all this kind of stuff. But he was patient. Uh, he listened. Uh, he, he just kept walking me along. And so I ended up teaching lots of different discipleship classes over the years. Ended up, uh, the church called me. Uh, my home church called me to serve on their staff, mm -hmm. uh, overseeing education ministry. And so that just, that grew eventually I, uh, when we moved to Alabama in 1996, God expanded that. And so that discipling moment was so crucial. He was the one that taught me how to get up in the morning and I'm a morning person. And so, you know, to start that first hour, started with God in prayer and reading the word and you know, that radically changed my life. Wow. And that thank you for that story that's incredible I, it, just the power of relationship and mm -hmm. and someone intentionally coming alongside of you it, in multiple scenarios and maybe those are i think you shared two examples maybe there could be more people i'm sure that you could list mm -hmm. that came along and really intentionally walked beside you and poured into you wow that is that's inspiring uh richard before we met which was I guess about a year ago, um, I had never encountered a chaplain in an organization that I worked in. I had never heard about an organization having a chaplain. So I think I asked you a lot of very basic questions <laughs> about corporate, corporate chaplains of America at that time. But I'm sure there's many people in our audience who are just unfamiliar. I mean, they've seen, they've seen chaplains, like you mentioned, in a military context or, or some other context, but they haven't seen them in the workplace. So can you talk a little bit about the types of organizations that you work with. And what I was impressed with was that this is very common. I, I hadn't seen it, but it's apparently very common that a lot of organizations are taking advantage of the services that you offer. It is, it really is. And, and so, you know, we've been around 26 years, but you know, like there were companies like RJ Reynolds uh, Tobacco that had chaplaincy a long time ago and, and several others that, you know, have precursors. I remember when I was in seminary, uh, driving over to Fort Worth one day and, and thinking and hearing a story about interstate battery having a chaplain. And I remember being really, really intrigued uh, by it. And that was I don't know, over 30 years ago. And so if you fast forward, you know, we now walk into every day uh, over 2,000 locations uh, across the, the United States and have a team of about 300 chaplains serving companies of all shapes and sizes. And, and, you know, and some are smaller, some are medium, some are really, really large with thousands and thousands of employees. Um, some are even publicly held. And, and so there's, there's all types of, of reasons. You know, uh, uh, a, lot of, a lot of companies will say, yeah, I, I am concerned uh, about a lot of things for my employees. So, I'm, you know, sometimes they start with, can you help us with employee retention? Well, yes, we can. We work with a major chicken processing uh, plant. And we just simply by inserting our chaplains into the onboarding process of all their new employees, they immediately had someone to talk to about life issues uh, rather than inserting us later on down the line. And so it drastically cut the turnover in that company. And they were very, very thankful. Uh, you know, another large company that we serve, you know, they would look at the ROI of chaplaincy as but you, you really help our employees with, with mental health issues that have become so much more prevalent uh, over the years. And whether it's you know, depression or anxiety or suicidal ideation, we spend a lot of time training our chaplains uh, to be experts in, in caring for people in those areas. Uh, and so, yes, there, there are many, many companies that, that uh, want a chaplain for, for spiritual reasons. They want, to be, you know, they want us to be a resource spiritually, emotionally, mentally, uh, and not just for them as employees, but they care about their families too. And so it's not uncommon for us to have care sessions, you know, uh, in McDonald's or Starbucks or whatever, after work, or, you know, with both the employee and their spouse. And, you know, sometimes they have something going on with one of their children and they have a children there. And so we, we make time for people. We make those weekly rounds to build a caring relationship 
and then we meet with people, you know, on their terms, uh, where, wherever they're comfortable, you know, in a public environment, uh, to sit down and talk about it and just walk things out with people. And you mentioned just having somebody to talk to. It, it sounds like, I mean, and we talk a lot about isolation on this podcast. It sounds like in a typical work setting, even though you're working with these people day in, day out, and you probably get to know them at some level, it sounds like there's a lot of people in the workplace who just are not comfortable having a real conversation with their coworkers and certainly not with their boss. Is that, is that a fair assessment? It's a very fair assessment because, you know, the, the, the person in the corner office is signing their paycheck. Mm -hmm. So literally when I'm talking to business owners sometimes, and there's, there's a lot of them that are very capable, but what we end up talking about is, okay, is that high performing individual going to come in and say, Hey, I'm actually a functional alcoholic. And, you know, every night I fall off the wagon or is that person going to come in uh, to the owner of the company and say, marriage is messed up or I've got a pornography addiction. And that, Sometimes they are, but most times they're not. And so with us, we've told them during our 15 minute orientation, everything is confidential. And unless you tell us you're gonna hurt yourself or someone else, or there's some kind of abuse involved, we're gonna keep it all under our hat. So you can tell us anything. And once they really believe that, you know, they start telling their friends, it's like, you really can trust these guys. And they open up because a lot of people don't have First of all, they don't want to talk about it always with their coworkers because they don't want it, you know, the gossip rumor mill or whatever to get going. And so they see us as holding their confidence. There's high levels of trust. So eventually they will tell us their deepest, darkest secrets, their, their, their heartbreaks, you know, all kinds of, of scenarios. You know, I was talking with someone uh, at a retail store one day and you know, as a young person, and I noticed they were wearing a heart monitor. That seemed a little bit mm -hmm. odd. And, uh, you know, they had a racing heart issue, and they actually had to stay within 20 minutes of a hospital at any given point in time. Uh, and as soon as it got to a certain rate, they had to immediately go to the ER. And so we, we talk about the stress of that. Uh, and, you know, on a break, uh, her boss said, yeah, you can go talk to the chaplain. And so we sat down and just through many, many tears, you know, she, she poured her heart out. Um, but I mean, she let me have a spiritual conversation with her. Uh, yeah. that was just beautiful. And, and she looked at me afterwards and, and, you know, she, she actually, you know, became a Christian that day. And as we were talking, she said, thank you. I knew there had to be a way to God, but no one ever told me how to get there. Mm. Wow. And, and, and so, you know, she didn't grow up in a family like I did. So it was different for her. And, and she, she knew there had to be a way, but literally no one had built a relationship that she felt comfortable having that conversation. And so since I was there every week, she felt comfortable having it. Wow. And I worked a variety of places where... <laughs> You weren't told to compete with your coworkers, but there was this intrinsic feeling that you had to because every year, especially when the company wasn't doing well, they would prune the bottom 5%, the bottom 10%. You know, even, even in, in companies that were doing fairly well, they had this policy or this process of regularly getting rid of the underperformers or those who are perceived that way. So yeah, the last thing you would do in those situations is open up to a coworker with wh with whom you're competing and say, yeah, I'm having problems at home. <laughs> I mean, that person might nod his head and, oh, you know, but he he'll take that information and use it to his advantage, potentially. So, yeah, I, I was rather reluctant to open up to my <laughs> to my coworkers in those types of organizations. Sure. It, it's really it's a special thing to realize. You know, someone, you, you know, that moment's coming, you're building the relationship and you know, there's a lot of chit chat, you know, talking about football games and, you know, deer season and all this kind of stuff. And, and, you know, we, 
people like open up are like, well, have you seen my social media? You, you, you want to be my friend there too? You know, and, and then you, you say, oh yeah, I saw you on a birthday party. Tell me about how that went, you know, and, and they just kind of let you into their lives. Mm. And then the next thing you know, they're, they're saying, hey, is this really confidential? Mm. I don't really trust you because I'm about to tell you, I mean, mm. you have time chaplain because I got to get something off my chest. And, you know, here comes something, maybe it's about marriage, maybe it's about their family of origin. Uh, you know, it, it could be anything, but mm -hmm. it's the thing that's keeping them up at night. And it's, so we don't wag our fingers in their face and tell them what to do. Uh, we kind of use more of a Socratic method of just asking really mm -hmm. good open questions so that they can come to their own conclusion. Mm -hmm. uh, and then, you know, we do have situations where, you know, there are times and, Things are over our head, and we we all all our chaplains have networks in the city, and so we make referrals. So I, I made one to uh, had an employee one time who was, you know, life of the party, salesman's personality. You know, always had a quick joke for me, and then one day he was really sad, and it was a dramatic, you know, difference. So I asked him. I said, uh, "How you doing today?" Again, just asking those questions. And I said, "Are you all right? You, you need to talk." He said. I don't think my wife's going to make it through the week. Wow. I said, oh, that's a big statement. Tell me what that means. He said, well, she's off her medication. And you know, she, she's bipolar. And so I'm just really concerned for her. Like, what, is anybody sitting with her right now while you're at work? We are best friends with her. And so I realized that she, she needed help. But he looked at me and he goes, there's nothing you can do, chaplain. Mm. I don't have insurance with my employer. There's nothing you can do. And I said, well, again, this permission thing. I said, would you give me permission to go talk to your benefits administrator and just see? Mm. And it was, it's, it's worthless. It's a waste of time. I don't have insurance. And said, Let me go see. So I went in. And I said, can I mention your name? You know. He said, yeah, yeah, yeah. Thanks for going to bat with me. And I walked away and I talked to the administrator and I explained the, the situation. And she smiled. And I was like, why are you smiling? She goes, because my best friend specializes in this uh, professionally as a counselor. Hmm. And she just called me and said, I, I just kind of feel led that if there, you have any employees that have this particular situation, and they don't have insurance, can you please send them to me? <laughs> That's and, crazy. Yeah, and so that, 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 that guy's wife went to this counselor and she got, got them the help that they needed. Wow. Now tell me, how thankful do you think that employee was? Wow. He, he went from, she may end up taking her own life this week, I am scared to death. I don't know what to do. This I'm over my head with this stuff. And you know, we we helped him see that God saw his plight, that God saw his his need, and he met that greatest need. And so, beautiful conversation came out of that. Tell tell me if this resonates with you because this is the the picture that just came into my mind as you're sharing the story. I envision you guys as as the trust bridge between right between the the employees and and the and the business or the owners um because i how many employees i i i'm sure it's happened have have just kind of written off any possibility of having any dialogue or uh or or that there'd be any possibility that the the business owner would would care about what is going on in their life mm -hmm. uh and then someone like you comes along um it, it's such a it's a beautiful picture of who who christ is as our intermediary you know like you are advocating on behalf of these employees to the business to the business owners for the sake of of the kingdom you know well and it's so many of our when we talk to these business owners before we start serving we'll list what so tell us your story you know how did your company grow and like how did you end up sitting here and, and they tell us that story and along the way you see these little segments of them wanting to care for other people 
And, and so they say, yeah, yeah. I'm a business, but like, this is my mission field. Like the, this is an opportunity to sow into other people. And so I, 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 sh I served one company and they, they maybe had 10 employees uh, here in Huntsville, Alabama, and they had some in another city. And, and, and so I got to know the owner really well. And the first time I ever met him, you know, he said, we're sitting at a lunch together. And he said, you know, someone told me the other day, I can be a little bit arrogant and gave some examples of how we can do that. He goes, can you help me with that? Huh. Okay. That wow. just told me everything I needed to know about this guy. Right? Yeah, right. And, and so it just kept getting richer and richer because like one day I was there making rounds and he goes, oh, my IT consultant's going to come by. I want you to meet him. Uh, his name is Donald, and I have permission to share this story, by the way. And, and so Donald was a little bit different. And I, I just wanted to get to know. I mean, again, I still have this thing in me. What, what makes this person tick? What's important to them? And what's, what's going on in their life? And it broke my heart as I got to know Donald that both his parents were deceased. Um, mm -hmm. Both of them had been drug addicts and had physically abused him. And you know, he had some issues as a result of it. But he was very open, a real tender spirit. And so we would just talk on a regular basis. And he was trying to go to school, but he had a lot of mental health issues because of his family of origin situation. And he, he just couldn't. And then it became, and he lived with his grandparents that loved him dearly. But then they both passed away. And then he was living in this house and had a mortgage. He couldn't pay it. And he became suicidal. And I, there were nights that we had a, a, an agreement with Donald. This owner and I did. If you ever feel like that, would you please call us? We'll get on a three-way call. Mm -hmm. So we did it multiple times. And one night, here we are. The owner's talking to Donald. You know, he's, he, he's really just pouring into him. And he's texting me going, Chaplain, what are you, what are you going to do? I said, well, already got a car rolling up that's sitting in front of his house right now it's an unmarked police car and we need to get him to you know professional help right now mm. and donald trusted us enough with that that he went mm. and that night he did not take his life but we had those conversations on multiple times all three of us on the phone together mm -hmm. so that owner knew that he, he loved his employees small business but he knew that we needed to work together. Uh, we made a great team together. And if you fast forward, we actually got Donald into the downtown rescue mission in Huntsville. And they did amazing, amazing work for him. So much so that God, you put him in that safe place to help him be transformed and to heal from his past. So much so that he walked into my church one day and said, I'm coming to your small group. Uh, I'd act, actually like to say something. And I'm like, okay, Donald, as long as I've known you, you are not a public speaker. You've got more verbal ticks and ands and us and, and <laughs> funny sounds coming out of your mouth. Like, <laughs> he goes, not anymore. He goes, watch what happens. So I called the leader over and like, give this guy a few minutes. Yeah, he talked for 45 minutes, told the most amazing story, told all these times about how he was suicidal, but he's not now, and how God has just helped his, his mind and, and move forward, heal from everything that happened to him as a kid. And I'm like, oh my. And just the most amazing thing. And you see this person completely transformed in front of you. Uh, and, and now he's holding down a job. He's, he <laughs> does great work. Uh, he's got a girlfriend, you know, I mean, it's, it's a really big deal uh, to see the transformation that occurred out of that and to be able to work, you know, with that business owner like that. I know a lot of small business owners and I had the privilege of helping to run a small business for six years. And I would say that it's very difficult to have a successful business long-term if you don't care about your employees. But I think the challenge for people who own or run small businesses is you just don't have the time. You know, you'd like to meet with, I mean, this, this owner you mentioned, I mean, he's on the phone at three in the morning with an employee, but I mean, that's, that's hard to, that's hard to do. I mean, you, you've got, 
you got to deal with customers and suppliers and partners and competitors and you know what's the business plan how are we going to grow and all these things in addition to managing your own life Mm -hmm. so you want to help employees but you just don't have a lot of time to do that and you feel bad because you want them to be successful not just in the company but in their own personal lives so it sounds like Mm -hmm. this is really a great thing for and I'm, not, I'm mentioning small businesses, but you mentioned that larger organizations take advantage of it too. We do. It's interesting. I was in a, a large company in uh, uh, Florida and we were just getting to know, we were meeting with their leadership team and just great folks. They, they have a good culture, uh, but they've grown so much. And, you know, so one of the leadership team guys said, you know, I love caring for people. Um, but, and I used to be the guy that I'd run to the hospital if I heard somebody was there, I'd right. go visit with somebody and just let them talk. So he was kind of on the front end of, of being a, a listening ear. And he goes, I know there's crazier things going on now with people and I don't need to be talking with them. I also know that I don't have that bandwidth anymore. You know, they yep. had, at the time they had over a thousand employees, and, but he had plowed the ground for us. Mm-hmm. in a lot of ways and so it, it wasn't abnormal for us to come in people saw that as a natural next progression and so they were very very open uh, to it you know and this you know some of these companies are, are publicly held and and you just kind of walk things out with them and you know, you learn how to, how to serve in unique environments you know, some of our chaplains make night rounds with third shift mm-hmm. employees and you know, some we have to spend a little bit less time because it's busy, busy, busy. And yeah. others we can spend and linger a little bit more because they can work and talk at the same time. So we're not there to disrupt uh, workflow in any way, shape, or form. Yeah. But when we come in for what we call that moment of encouragement, people are like, they're really good for that because that's that reminder mm-hmm. to later call the chaplain or to use our TAP app to schedule an appointment. Uh, and that's when things really open up during what we call care sessions. Hmm. Yeah, any any type of industry you think about, it doesn't, you know, large companies with thousands of employees all over the country, they have the same issues as a small business owner. Right. We can, we'd like to think we can compartmentalize all that and not bring it to work. It's not hmm. possible. Right. I had one company that every time I walked through the door, uh, a manager would meet me and say, these three people, go talk to them. (laughs) They were messing everything up today and they can't focus. So get their head screwed on right. And like, (laughs) it was a little abrupt. I was like, I remember this is voluntary. So I I appreciate you giving me a heads up, but you know, they have to be open to talking. Nine times out of 10, they were open. And so I'd go talk to them, right? And and then, Simply listening to say Mm. a struggling single mom Mm. trying to make ends meet and Mm. getting her in a better place. Well, let's do a budget. Mm. All right. So let's put it out in black and white. You trust me to walk you through that? Oh, yeah, yeah. Mm. People will talk to you about their budget. They'll talk to you about anything. Well, that person could then come back and focus. Or the young man who had just had a major fight with his wife Mm. and is thinking, oh, no, what have I done? They just kind of just need a little time, uh, maybe some insights, you know, from a guy that had been married a lot longer. And, and you know, that guy comes back and then the, here's the manager saying, dude, you need to tell me what you said to those people because it worked. <laughs> I just smiled. <laughs> you know, I can't do that. That's gone. I didn't. Yeah, or I didn't say much, really. <laughs> it could be that too, right? Maybe it's just yeah. the employee sharing. Yeah. So, okay, that's a good transition because I wanted, this is what I wanted, I wanted to ask you next because I've heard this before talking to other folks who are with Corporate Chaplains of America, just the um, the insight that you're able to provide for business owners about what's going on, you know, on the floor or wherever. And now, obviously, there are confidentiality issues, which you just mentioned that you're not going to breach. But um, I have heard how about how chaplains will often be brought into some of the C-suite discussions, for example, or meetings to give them an added perspective of what's going on. Um, can you speak to that at all? Does, do you see that happen? 
Sure, there's been companies that say, hey, can you come in for this segment of our staffing? Yeah. Uh, you know, and there's, I worked for a, a home builder at one point that uh, did, you know, I think every two weeks, every four weeks of a staffing, have everybody come in. Well, mm -hmm. one of their chaplain there to, to listen, okay, so not jump in the middle of their operations, but right. he, the owner said, I want, it, I want you to be there when I celebrate these new home sales professionals and uh, the great work they do. I want you to listen mm -hmm. as we're talking about starting a new development. Actually, I want you to go up there with us when we have a picnic up there, and I want you to pray over this land. You know, and, and so it was, it's really great to be in those environments. And, you know, some, some of the companies will let me in that environment do maybe a three or four minute devotion on stress or something like that. And, mm. and so it was great times to engage with people. Uh, and then we always sit down and some, some companies, depending on how large they are, want a quarterly meeting. Some people want an annual review. And it's kind of a state of the union of, of chaplaincy and its mm. impact. And so they'll want, they'll want to look at all of our metrics that we track, you know, how many times were we there, uh, how many conversations did we have. So we hold ourselves very, very accountable to that. Uh, you know, the employee just sees us walk around and they'll be jokingly going, I wish I had your job. You just walk around high five about crazy stories. Uh, what they don't know is there's a whole lot going on behind the scenes. And so we try to, we share with, with owners and leadership teams if people give us permission to share a life-changing story mm -hmm. and, and how God used a chaplain in some way, then we want to do that. So we're going to share the statistics, all the metrics. But a lot of owners are like, I can't feel that. Give me something I can feel. Mm -hmm. And what a joy it is. And I had an employee that um, came to faith in Christ. And it was you know, a beautiful moment. Um, and then fast forward two years. And he goes, can I really tell you anything? You can tell me anything. Just, all right, this is going to be in the paper tomorrow. So I need you to tell me how to handle it with my company. And he had actually absconded with some funds as a treasurer of a small little uh, entity in town, but it had caught up with him. And, you know, as a, as a Christian, I wanted to be honest about it. So he said, I think I need to tell everybody what I did because this is going to be in the paper. And it's kind of a big deal. It you know, might lose the security clearance. Uh, and all of a sudden, everything changes. And I said, all right, let's, can I go with you? You know, you told me all this. Can you, will you give me permission to share some of the details if you're getting tongue-tied or nervous or whatever? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And HR trusted the chaplain so much, they just said, work it out with them. So I actually went to federal court with the guy. Hmm. And so he had written, you know, we had written a letter to the judge saying his life has been transformed. So he just told me he did this. Uh, so ironically, what got him in federal court was the fact that he started paying the money back. <laughs> of course. <laughs> yeah. Right. So, <laughs> he handed me his car keys. We're standing on the steps of the courthouse. He handed me his car keys. Goes, I'm probably not leaving. Can you make sure my car gets on? He puts car keys back in his hands and said, don't go there. Hmm. Let's just see what happens. So he did not tell me that he was going to get up, waved his attorney off, and he asked the judge. He said, judge, you should throw the book at me. But I'm asking you to give me grace. Can I just tell you my story? Wow, he shared his his fence post story, right? Wow. In federal court, and he was a Marine. He started crying, and he really was very repentant. Hmm. And he said, "The reason I'm standing here is when when I realized I needed God in my life, everything changed." And I felt immediately convicted, thinking back to something that happened two years ago. I need to pay that money back. I need to make amends. And so he started doing it. And he's telling this story in federal court. And then the, the, the judge looks at the prosecuting attorney and says, have you ever seen such godly sorrow lead to repentance? That told me a lot about her worldview. Right. She asked the prosecuting attorney, do you have any questions? 
for this for this uh, person, and she said nope. And so she didn't even you know interrogate him. And the judge sentenced him, raised her gavel, and said, "I sentenced you to ten. And I'm like, "Oh no!" And she smiled. And she goes, ten weeks of volunteer work. Uh, I suspect you'll find a place to do it." And, and he had already told everybody he was driving a forklift at a at a uh, food and clothing place in town. And I'm like, "Wow, I can't believe that just happened." And, and so I got a front row seat to seeing a miracle there and seeing a life that was changed. But what do you think that leadership team? Hmm. You know, this was all over the news. Hmm. What do you think that the impact that had on them? <laughs> yeah, that was just such a beautiful thing to see. Was it was I, when I went to that the owner of that company and said thank you for trusting us. I was like, yeah, I couldn't jump in the middle of all that. But I'm so glad you're here. And he started telling everybody he knew in town. Uh, that's the reason why we have a bunch of chaplains running around Huntsville, Alabama, as well as yeah. other many other cities, because that those kind of things happen. You can't contain that. You know, it's just such a beautiful story of transformation. Chris, this has got to be one of the most inspiring interviews I think we've done. I am, I'm like, my heart is so inflated. Oh, right yeah. Now. <laughs> that is incredible. Richard, that these stories are amazing. And if, if, yeah, if guys aren't listening to this, if you're a business owner or you're in, in corporate America and you're listening to this, man, I hope you're taking note of this. And uh, man, it, the value that, that corporate chaplains of America bring to, uh, to the corporate world. I mean, it, it's incredible. It's incredible. Um, okay. It's cause, so, it's cause the need is so great. I mean, just, you know, yeah. we're all in our, we're all in our isolated little bubbles and we're, you know, whether it's in the corporate world or somewhere else, we're, we're all living yeah. these lives of, you know, distance from other people <laughs> and putting on a front that everything's great. And just to have somebody to, to open up to can yeah. lead to such dramatic change. I mean, it's not going to be a dramatic change in every situation, but just having sure. that, having that person there is such a valuable resource. Which yeah. I want to ask you, um, I think we, we talked about this a little bit up front, but it may have been before the show uh, got started. Um, so obviously, everybody's talking about the past two years and the effects mm -hmm. of the pandemic and our response to the pandemic. And you know, people working from home or working in different situations. And so can you talk a little bit about what you're seeing in terms of the need uh, from a chaplain standpoint? And if you want to be so bold, can you predict what you think is going to happen the next couple of years based on what you've experienced in the past two years? Sure. That's a really good question, Chris, because, you know, when I flew back from Florida last night, I had to, had to have a mask on in the airport and on the plane and knowing, okay, eventually I'm going to drop the mask and they're, they're, I won't have to wear them on a plane anymore. But you can't just say I'm going to drop all the mental health issues that have just ramped up uh, with anxiety being number one. Like we track all this in our extended care session reporting, you know, anxiety depression, suicidal ideation, we have seen a 65% increase in anxiety and depression care sessions in the last two years. Uh, in the last four years, we've seen like a 70% increase in suicidal ideation. Wow. You know, it, it's, it's scary to think about how all the isolation, all the stress, you know, not just with COVID, but there's so many things that people are facing uh, these days. And so we are spending far more time dealing with mental health things. In fact, one of our largest clients asked us to come in with a, a tool uh, called mental, aid, mental, or mental Health First Aid and walk all of their key leaders through it. Uh, so in their stores, and so you know, probably 40 something stores and all of their HR professionals, as well as each store leadership team, walk through this. And what they really wanted us to do is like point this out. This is this is y'all area of specialty. Help us understand 
the some of the symptoms, right, of, of certain mental health issues, you know, anxiety and depression being really paramount. So we can recognize that and then caringly ask people, hey, are you okay? Do you need someone to talk to? Uh, would you like to talk to the chaplain about this? And again, permission-based, voluntary, uh, really, really important. But not only are we walking into companies and leaders are asking us, can you, can you help us with this? Can you develop some things? You know, we've done uh, some classes on things like this as well. And so it opens things up. So one of the things I'm seeing is more and more companies are realizing, I really need to address this. Uh, studies show that pre-pandemic um, employees are saying, you don't need to be in my business about my mental health. Like 60% of the people said that. Right. After the last couple of years, that flipped and 62% of people are saying, I need you to help me with my mental wow. health. And so more and more companies are reaching out to us just for that. You know, and maybe they never thought of chaplaincy from the spiritual side of things, but they certainly see the the epidemic just of so many people being depressed and and anxious. Well, of course, that comes through on their day to day job performance and things like that, mm -hmm. or even showing up at work. It's not uncommon for someone to call a, a HR person and say, you know, job abandonment is really a big deal these days. Mm -hmm. uh, it's nothing for someone to show up, to get trained, work a little bit, and then boom, they go to yep. the employer. Well, companies have actually been known to call us and say, they're not returning our calls. They might talk to you, but we don't want enough details. We just we want them to know that we care for them. We'd love to have them back. And so we can go talk to that employee and, and kind of talk to them about, hey, you're working for a great company. Let's think through their their core values. Remember that they're really trying to live that. And you know, before you go to the company down the road for an extra quarter an hour, let's let's think through this. Hmm. Let's think of how they walk some things out with you. And so it helps with employee retention. But really, we can use that conversation as a starting point for what's really going on, because we know people that are living with a lot of stress and anxiety tend to make decisions that are different than if they were in a better place. Uh, so sitting down and really getting to the core issues uh, with people is super important for us. Uh, there's still so much stress out there from the damage the last couple of years has caused in, in people's lives. You know, where I live, you know, I've got, I've got um, government type contractors that calling me, you know, that have to employ a lot of engineers. And they're like, Richard, my engineers love working remotely. Right. Not so much anymore. They used to, but now they are even lonely mm -hmm. and they need interaction. So let's, mm -hmm. let's work together on, on how to put some things together to care for these people. Uh, so it doesn't matter what industry you're in. It's really affected everyone. And the great thing about it is employees are more vocal now about some of their needs. And so we're actually, I've talked to two chamber of commerce and a, and a, a business advisory uh, lunch about you know, what we do with mental health. And you talk about em employers leaning into that and I'm listening now. How can you help my team? Hmm. It's very prevalent. Man, it, your role, it's funny if it was, it, if it was, significant before the pandemic, it is all the more critical after the pandemic. Um, so something that, that folks need to think about if they own a business or they run, you know, they're in the, that, uh, that maybe that C-suite and have some pool and um, might be able to open up a dialogue with, uh, with corporate chaplains of America to see about bringing someone in for them. Uh, how would, if, if somebody is listening and they're like, oh man, I'm sold, I need to, I need to reach out, who, who would they talk to? Where would they go to start the process, you know, to, to possibly hire a corporate chaplain? Yeah, if you want to put my contact in, in the show notes, I'll be happy to yeah. point them. Uh, depends on where they are in the country uh, and who our field development rep is that will be talking to them. But if, they, if you want to give them my contact for starters, 
I'll be glad to point them in the right direction. Okay. And then if somebody, let's say someone out there is like, man, I want to be a corporate chaplain. <laughs> what, what would their next step be? Sure. They can always go to chaplain.org and uh, check out our website. And we've got a whole section on uh, what it looks like to join our team. And, you know, we're, we're pretty picky. We, we only hire one out of every 38 chaplains. Wow. We call them. Uh, and that gives us like a 92% retention rate of both chaplain and client. Um, but it's important to us that they have seven to 10 years of real world work experience. Because if they're walking around a plant or a cubicle world or whatever, they need to know what that's like. And they didn't know when they can and can interact with people. You know, we prefer a master's of divinity. Uh, we, we have some wiggle room on that based on experience, but we get a lot of spiritual questions all day long. So we need to be able to comfortably uh, feel those. We, we hire people who, who love people. Mm. They just love being in front of people. If they understand crises, don't make appointments, and they're probably going to have to change their schedule uh, a little bit every day to respond <laughs> to those things. Uh, and you know, they need to be just as comfortable talking to uh, the CEO as they are the, the day one brand new janitor employee. You know, because we go back and forth, we call it white collar men, women, uh, all, all the time. And uh, we try to hire people that are really good listeners and that are very empathetic. Uh, that have a high emotional intelligence that it, it, they know people know they care and they know what kind of questions to ask. They don't make it about them uh, and they're not poking their finger in anyone's face. Uh, they're just letting that person open up at their speed. Yeah. And one thing we actually failed to mention, this is unbelievable, is that you're a CLC alumni. <laughs> You've yes. been through CLC yourself, which is no surprise now hearing your heart and knowing uh your your uh your heart for for discipleship and relationship like you just explained it that's this beautiful well and it's a beautiful thing that that really helped the men in our small group uh we did the, the getting real study and when we shared our fence post story we went to a different level yeah and we surprised each other like i never knew that about you because we're really just taking the time to unpack it all. Like we'd heard little snippets here and there, but now we saw the big picture and yeah. a glorious thing to experience. Richard Buckley, man, it is, we're so grateful to have had you and, and hear your story. This has been an incredible, incredible time together with you. Let me, uh, let's, let's pray. I just want to pray for you and uh, Corporate Chaplains of America before, uh, before we wrap up here. Thank you. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for this time together. I just, man, I'm blown away, God, by the way that you are moving um, and, and working in people's lives in so many ways, Lord, even going ahead of us, preparing the way. Um, you so clearly did that in Richard's life. And, uh, and you're doing that through Corporate Chaplains of America in, in people's lives every day, Lord, where you are providing hope and healing and relationship and connection um, and productivity, which is, which also plays into that Lord and, and health of, of these businesses and corporations, Lord. Um, thank you so much for the role that corporate chaplains plays. Thank you, father, for Richard, for the role he plays, for how you have prepared him for just such a time as this, for just such a role as this God. I pray, Father, you to continue to sustain him, encourage his heart in his role, and, uh, and Father, provide everything he needs to serve you well. And we pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank, Thank you. you, Richard. Really enjoyed it.